They work up to 18 hours a day in 120 degree heat without a water break. Dehydration is inconsequential. They, carry, they can carry up to 18 bricks on their in complete, eerie silence. The dust, the heat, the monotony day in and day out, seven days a week. There are no sick days. They just simply work. They may have been born there on the site, or their great-grandfather may have borrowed the equivalent of $100, yet generations will pay for that loan. They live in abject poverty and utter humiliation. This may be the only thing generations have ever known, and they don't know this is not okay. This, what is this? This is bonded labor. It is a financial crime. They do it to make a profit, but at whose cost? When most of us talk about human trafficking, we think about sex slavery, brothels, and prostitutes. And yes, that is there, and it is barbaric. But let's peel the onion back and sting our eye and think about the slavery that built our home, that picks our food, or built the clothes that we're wearing. We all rely on slave labor more than we realize. Let's look at some of the numbers. <laughs> In 2012, the International Labor Organization estimated over 14 million people are in forced labor. Present day, they estimate it closer to 18 to 20 million, and 85% of that is in South Asia, which means present day, there's over 14 million slaves in India alone. The goal is simple, to push the cost of labor to as close to zero as possible. The goods they make have value, but the person making them does not. It is difficult to state the case against bonded labor any better than the Indian, Indian Chief Justice, P.N. Bhagwati, did in an opinion in the 1983 case in the Supreme Court. Bonded labor has been prevalent in our country since long prior to the attainment of political freedom, and it constitutes an ugly and shameful feature of our national life. This system is based on exploitation and suffering of large numbers of people, treats economically impoverished segments of society as dirt. The system under which one person can be bonded to provide labor to another for years and years till an alleged debt is supposed to be wiped out and never seems to happen in that lifetime of that bonded laborer. It is incompatible with the new egalitarian social economic order. It is not only an affront to basic human dignity, but also constitutes gross and revolting violation of constitutional values. Unfortunately, since this Chief Justice gave this opinion in 1983, not a lot has changed. Actually, the traffickers have become more skillful and adapted to meet the global economic needs with remarkable efficiency. During the transatlantic slave trade, you could purchase the slave for as much as $30,000, but in India today, you can buy a human being for 90. Yet slavery in, Ill in India is illegal, but according to the 2015 U.S. State Department Trafficking in Persons Report, only 77 cases were investigated. 14 million slaves, 77 cases investigated. How did India get here? Key features of how bonded labor happened in India, destitute, extreme poverty and utter hopelessness. There's a caste system or a minority ethnic group. 90% of all bonded laborers are from the Dalit community, vulnerable. Corruption, there's lack of rule of wall. Traffickers function with impunity, population explosion. The most vulnerable are children. My husband and I used to run an orphanage out of Navi, Mumbai for four years. And I think one of the hardest cases we ever saw were two young girls that landed on our doorstep. Their father had died when they were young, and would believe their mother came to Mumbai looking for work. But she died, literally, on the street, cirrhosis of the liver. And we only know this because of the autopsy. Unfortunately, a nefarious man found those two girls and took them to his country liquor store or a shack and forced them to serve men alcohol all day long. They were six and eight years old. Thanks to a nosy neighbor and a good cop, she reported him and they arrived on our doorstep, and I'll never forget that day. They were shell-shocked, they were skin and bones, and they were terrified. They lived with us in our orphanage for three years, and they blossomed. They are currently in an orphanage outside Mumbai, and they're in school, they're safe, and they're thriving. But they are two of the fortunate ones. Companies knowingly and unknowingly build in plausible deniability. 
between the grower, the producer, the distributor. <clears throat> there are layers between the brick kiln, the contractor, and the builder, ultimately the builder. None of us would knowingly purchase the home in 2018 and know that there's slave labor on that brick. There's blood and sweat. Yet, <clears throat> living in Mumbai, we can literally drive by a brick kiln or a stone quarry and see slavery. After learning about this over the last 10 years of our work in Mumbai, I literally get a pit in my stomach every time I drive by a brick kiln because I know the slavery that happens there. And globally, when I go back home and I see a t-shirt, in the mall for $2 made in Guatemala. How can a t-shirt cost $2? These are all choices we all have to make when we look at the cost of these items. Some of the most common industries specifically in India, brick kilns, agriculture, constructions, carpets, stone breaking, bindis, shrimp, and domestic help. One of the girls that we have helped in our bakery is from an infamous triangle in Karnataka that thousands of girls have been enslaved from. She was initially running away from a forced marriage, which is a form of slavery, and at the age of 10 or 11 was on a train from Mumbai. We met her through one of our partner NGOs. She doesn't talk about the years from the day she landed at the train station to the day that the NGO rescued her. She's now a proud mom, married to a good guy, and like most of these survivors, men or women, they don't want our pity. They want the dignity of work. They want the pride of a paycheck, and they want the satisfaction of a job well done. Liberation is a process, and historically it has been botched. We have to ensure that they do not come out of slavery as second-class citizens. They need to be given access to basic education, economic opportunities, and political participation. What? would happen if everyone in this room no longer supported companies that weren't willing to look at their supply chain and eliminate slavery? What would happen if every CEO had the courage to really, really do a supply chain audit and see and look for slavery? What if they were and be the change? Personally, in our small business, one of our most vulnerable products is chocolate. We're always looking for fair trade chocolate. How can we abolish slavery? Direct access to eliminate the expensive middleman. Fast track courts and an update since I started writing this in 2000, I'm sorry, in March 5th, there's currently legislation that is supposed to be one of the best laws in the world right now against traffickers in India, and it includes fast track courts. Effective um, poverty and education initiatives. <coughs> That if each company hired a Dalit, and not just hired them, it nurtured them, and would all of us be willing to spend a little bit more money for a product that is fairly traded? When I first came to India in January 2006 on a humanitarian trip, I looked at slavery, and I looked at it in the eye. And for the first time, it gripped me. It is not that we don't have slavery in the U.S. and in other parts of the world we do, but in India, it stared me in the face. I tried to go back to my Manhattan life and my job at the bank, but there was this pull on my heart and it never went away. And ultimately, I do consider this a call in my life. We are all part of the problem, but that means we can all be part of the solution. Working in a slave-free world is our job to do, to be the change and to open our eyes to the things unseen.